How's it going guys? We're going to be watching SCP-1467, The Disappearing Man. This is the SCP animation, and I'm going to leave a link in the description down below. And let's get into this. Oh yeah, remember to you know, subscribe and like and all that stuff. So. The SCP Foundation is an organization that polices the abnormal in all its forms. Whether it's a multi-dimensional chaos god, a big scaly monster, or a very effective coffee machine, the Foundation takes a pointed interest in pretty much anything outside the norm. So you're probably wondering, what would they want with Mr. Smith, a man who was about as normal and average as could be? Mr. Smith was a 47-year-old African-American construction worker with a wife and daughter. He lived okay. a modest but contented life. He had a close circle of friends, a happy family, and was well-liked among his co-workers. But Mr. Smith had no idea about the anomalous nightmare barreling down the tracks towards him. Mr. Smith wasn't just about to have his life destroyed by an anomaly. He was about to become one. It seemed like a normal day at work on the construction site when he received a phone call. It was the police, informing him that his wife and young daughter had been involved in a terrible car accident. While this is anyone's worst nightmare, it was only the start of the horrifying things that were about to happen to poor, poor Mr. Smith. That night, when Mr. Smith went to sleep, he fell victim to a strange phenomenon. He started to disappear. While it would be easy to write off as the result of mental illness, like a kind of stress-induced mental breakdown, Mr. Smith wasn't the only one who noticed, or rather, didn't notice. His co-workers would slowly begin to forget details about him, even obvious things that you could glean from simply looking at a person, like clothes, height, or skin color. It seemed that, little by little, ever since his family died, Mr. Smith was becoming an unperson. This led to increasing levels of fear, paranoia, and distress, as people whom he'd thought of as his closest friends could barely recognize him anymore. Thankfully, Mr. Smith wasn't just going to slip into non-existence without a fight. He realized early on that his new condition seemed to abide by certain rules. The effects got worse in the night when he was alone, but seemed to lessen somewhat during the day when he was interacting with people. It seemed that he disappeared just that little bit more whenever he wasn't being interacted with. And perhaps he hadn't developed this condition upon the death of his wife and child. Maybe he'd had it for a while, but it was the constant presence of his family that kept the effects from worsening. But now that he'd properly identified the problem, Mr. Smith could begin devising some solutions. If nobody- What is up with black people becoming SCPs now? I don't, this is like the second time now, but whatever. Nobody else was there to interact with him at night. He'd keep his position in reality stable by interacting with himself. Mr. Smith would repeat his own name to himself regularly reaffirming his existence to himself. He'd often check his own pulse to feel the rhythm of his heartbeat. He'd write detailed descriptions of himself, either on his own body or a surrounding surface. And in one particular stroke of genius, he devised a method of recording his own voice talking to himself and playing it back while he was asleep to stave off reality decay. During the day, while at work or just existing socially in the world, He'd do everything he could to constantly interact with people. That way, they could keep reaffirming his presence, and therefore, continuing his existence. The symptoms of Mr. Smith's condition are somewhat similar to a rare mental illness known as the Cotard Delusion, in which a patient believes they are dead, dying, or don't even exist. Except in Mr. Smith's unfortunate case, the delusion was becoming a reality. And this was a reality that Mr. Smith could only hold off for so long. Little by little, the coping mechanisms he'd built to manage his new life uh, began damn. to collapse. People in his inner circle truly began to forget him. His company no longer recognized him as an employee. To the people who barely knew him, he was little more than a ghost. A kind of palpable absence. This was the point when the SCP Foundation finally got involved. They swooped in and apprehended Mr. Smith, redesignating him as SCP-1467. It was one of the rare occasions that the Foundation didn't need to apply any amnestic treatment to bystanders, because, due to the nature of Mr. Smith's anomalous activity, almost everyone who knew him was already in the process of forgetting him. 
When the Foundation interviewed a man that Mr. Smith referred to as a close friend, he couldn't even recall Mr. Smith's basic physical traits with any reliability. Because Damn. of Mr. Smith's condition, the Foundation had real difficulty verifying elements of his backstory. Mr. Smith told the Foundation researchers everything about himself, about his family and his life before, but field agents were stumped whenever they tried to follow up on the information. First, there were issues with the existence and fate of his supposed wife and child. No records were ever found of either of these people existing, and there was no existing documentation to prove that Mr. Smith was ever married. The Foundation also looked into the deaths of Mrs. Smith and her child. There were no records of a car crash in the area that Mr. Smith directed them to. But that's not all. There were also no death records, nor any graves ever found. The construction company that Mr. Smith claimed to work for had That's no really records weird. of his employment. They couldn't find any of Mr. Smith's supposed extended family either. The only proof that he had ever existed was his physical body, locked in a Foundation humanoid containment cell, and Mr. Smith's own words. If you think this sounds like a living nightmare, then Mr. Smith would wholeheartedly agree with you. The effects of his anomalous nature traumatized Mr. Smith. He was diagnosed by Foundation therapists as suffering from bipolar depression, as well as chronic sleep deprivation. Though if you disappeared a little more every time you slept, you'd probably lose a lot of sleep too. The unpredictable nature of Mr. Smith's anomalous traits could have equally unpredictable effects on the nature of his containment, so he was classified as Euclid. Mr. Smith is one of the few anomalies that is referred to by his real name at least to his face. When referred to as SCP-1467, Mr. Smith enters a state of rage and panic, and this mistake has caused several injuries for Foundation personnel during attempts to restrain him after using his Damn. SCP number around him. Mr. Smith is contained in a foam-padded cell to prevent self-destructive behavior, along with three audio recording devices, though these were installed at his own request in order to continue his habit of recording his own voice to play back to himself while asleep. This served the dual purpose of not only mitigating his fading from reality, but also keeping him calm and docile during containment. And these devices are kept in good working order in order to avoid creating hostility between Mr. Smith and Foundation staff. While it may seem that the anomalous effects of Mr. Smith purely served to create a personal hell for him and him alone, the Foundation wasn't so sure. The fact no records could be found of his wife, daughter, or extended family was concerning. It raised one frightening question. Are the effects of Mr. Smith's condition contagious? If so, he could be putting a lot of people in grave danger. Foundation scientists headed by senior researcher Dr. Thorne devised a series of experiments to better understand Mr. Smith's mysterious condition. There were 22 experiments in total, but things began to get interesting at around experiment 16. For this experiment, Mr. Smith was forcibly restrained and brought into a research chamber with research assistants Rainier and Dieter. They were told to simply observe Mr. Smith without interacting with him and record what happened in the process while Dr. Thorne supervised. At 10 minutes and 12 seconds, the researchers were unable to recognize the subject as Mr. Smith. At 14 minutes and 32 seconds, they were unable to recognize the clothes of Mr. Smith. Less than 10 minutes later, they were unable to identify his race. Five minutes after that, what? they couldn't identify what Mr. Smith was currently doing. 10 minutes later, they couldn't even identify how Mr. Smith was sitting. At almost 40 minutes, the research assistants weren't able to identify anything of Mr. Smith, save for the fact that there was some kind of humanoid creature in the room. At this point, research assistant Dieter started a recording, instructing Mr. Smith to describe himself on record. As this happened, Smith returned to a describable state, curled up in a fetal position on the floor. There was no sign of the restraints or the chair in which Smith had been placed. Subsequent tests showed similar results, with minor variations in timing. Just by being in physical contact with Mr. Smith, the chair and the restraints had literally faded out of existence. Evidence was really pointing towards Mr. Smith's anomalous effects being potentially detrimental to the people and objects around him. But the experiments continued. They had to know more before there was nothing left to know. The next series of experiments were performed with D-classes and led Dr. Thorne and his team of researchers to a number of frightening conclusions. 
Two D-classes locked in with Mr. Smith as he slipped out of existence began experiencing extreme states of terror and distress. Even when they could no longer see him, they could still feel the presence <laughs> of an crazy. entity in the room. When the two D-classes tried to escape, one of them was almost mistaken for Mr. Smith himself. He too was now starting to slip out of existence. Both D-classes were summarily terminated, and Dr. Thorne began to wonder whether Mr. Smith's condition was contagious, or if he was instead somehow able to lash out at others in his vicinity in a more localized fashion. Only two other experiments were ever performed on Mr. Smith before further experimentation into his case was permanently suspended. In the first, a non-violent D-class was placed in Mr. Smith's cell and ordered to ignore him. Mr. Smith didn't take this well. He began attacking the D-class, who fought back, breaking Mr. Smith's nose. Ironically, this physical attack was actually beneficial to Mr. Smith, as the violence helped ground him in reality and secured his existence just that little bit more. In the final experiment, Mr. Smith was given a cellmate, a female D-class who was allowed to acknowledge him. The two appeared to become close, and their time helped stave off Mr. Smith's fading just a little bit longer. It's unknown if she contracted his fading condition or somehow was able to escape, but one day while Mr. Smith slept, Whoa. she simply disappeared. Mr. Smith fell into a state of almost catatonic silence. Soon after, he began to speak again, only to repeat, I don't want to go again and again and again. Experiments concluded for good not long after. Because of his delicate mental state, Mr. Smith is allowed a visit from a therapist every week, and before any future experiments are performed on Mr. Smith, researchers are required to seek permission from his active therapist. Because of his effects on the minds of people aware of him, Foundation Protocol is to terminate Mr. Smith immediately if he ever breaches containment. The site director has also appended a memo to Smith's file, instructing personnel to refer to Mr. Smith as SCP-1467 whenever he's out of earshot. Doing otherwise will incur severe punishments. Records on Mr. Smith are backed up in six separate copies and stored in different locations, in hopes that this will prevent the information from decaying like Mr. Smith's existence. Mr. Smith's story is one of pain, tragedy, and existential horror. There's no shortage of SCPs that can cause XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios, but sometimes, the terror of these anomalies pales in comparison to SCPs that can bring one person's world crashing down around them. According to all the SCP Foundation studies, it's likely that Mr. Smith will disappear sometime soon, regardless of their intervention. Now check out SCP-096, look at a picture of the Shy Guy in space, Shy Guy questions and theories, and SCP-5031, yet another murder monster, for more SCP Foundation mystery. Well, that's in the video. If you guys uh, like that, you know, um, leave a like and comment, which I react to next. And, uh, yeah, goodbye. <laughs>